Hi everyone, this is Jack Dennis and welcome to our JD's Wide World of Fly Tying and Fly Fishing and all kinds of fun stuff from the world of the outdoors. Today we're going to go back into history and meet a friend of mine, Vic Bergman from uh, Canada, actually Alberta, Canada. And he is one of the, uh, I think, most interesting uh, fly fishing personalities that I met in my many visits to Canada doing sports shows and uh, fly fishing shows and clubs and getting to know uh, the fly fishing culture up in Canada. Both BC and Alberta has terrific uh, trout fishing and Vic was on uh, and had a fly shop along the Crow's Nest River and this presentation was originally done in the 90s uh, on VHS, uh, converted it off of VHS, and it's so well done tying the basic trout flies that he uses on his river. Uh, but the relationship of fishing the patterns and talking about the insects and showing the insects that the flies match is really just uh, uh, beyond belief considering how many years ago this was filmed. Uh, delightful man and I hope you enjoy uh, his tying techniques and the way he relates to the outdoors and the beautiful scenery of Alberta. So let's take it away with the Bergman. <laughs>
Well, we're back on the Crow's Nest River, and we've got a nice looking run ahead of us here for us to try our fly out. The Rick's Mink is a good fly to use early in the season because it can represent just about any type of food organism to trout. And at this time of the year, there still isn't really much for insect activity, so let's give it a try. There's one. There he is. Looks like a rainbow. Oh, he's running out right to me here. Sometimes they get away on you. It was a nice little rainbow. We'll try again. I'm using about a nine or 10 foot leader. Put a strike indicator on about six feet up from the fly. We're, we're in about three or four feet of water here. And I've also had to put on a couple of little split shots so that the fly will get right down to the bottom where the trout are. These indicators really help to show uh, when the fish is taking your fly. There's another fish. This guy's going to take me a ways downstream it looks like. Oh yeah, there he goes. I'm going to have to chase after this one. Nice rainbow. There he is. Took that little Rick's mink. And there he goes. That was fun. We'll have to try that again. The materials that you'll need to tie the Brooks Montana are dyed black stripped goose biots, black wool, medium copper wire, dark brown hackle, grizzly hackle, white ostrich hurl, lead wire to weight the hook, and a size four 3x long hook and black tying thread. The Brooks Montana nymph imitates the large stoneflies of the Terranarsis species that are found in many western trout streams. Although there are fly patterns that more closely imitate this insect, the overall shape and coloration of the Brooks Montana provides an excellent impression of the natural. I'll start by attaching my tying thread to the hook. Wrap my thread to the very back of the hook. Stoneflies live on the stream bottom, so it's very important to make sure that you fish your nymphs as close to the bottom as possible. So I usually like to add plenty of weight to the hook shank so that the nymph will sink as quickly as possible and get right down to the bottom of the stream. I'll wrap my lead to the uh, front of the hook, and then I'll continue wrapping the lead over itself towards the back of the hook. I'll just pinch off the extra lead and then I'll come back and take my tying thread and I'll wrap over top of the lead to secure it in place. This will help to keep the lead from sliding up and down the hook shank or twisting or turning. I'll take my thread and I'll move it to the very back of the hook. Next I'll take my black wool and I'll pull just a few fibers from the wool and 
I'll dub these right onto the tying thread. Next I'll take the thread and I'll form a very small ball at the back of the hook. It will keep the tail spread apart. For the tail I'll use black stripped goose biots and I'll just tear a couple of these from the quill. You'll notice that they have a natural curve to them and I'll tie one on each side of the hook so that they flare away from the hook shank. And I'm keeping the tail fairly short, it's only about one-third the length of the hook shank. Okay, I'll tie these down. Next I'll take my black wool and I'll tie it in on the top of the hook, somewhere around the middle of the, the hook shank. This will help to form a nice smooth taper for the uh, wool to be wrapped over afterwards. Next I'll take a short piece of medium copper wire and I'll tie this in also at the back of the hook and then I'll take my tying thread and I'll advance it up oh, to about the middle of the hook shank. And I'll take a little drop of head cement and I'll apply a little cement to the lower part of the hook. Next I'll take the wool and I'll begin wrapping it to the, towards the middle try to form a nice even taper as I go along. Okay, and then I'll just tie that down just to hold it in place so that it doesn't unravel on me while I wrap the copper wire. The copper wire not only strengthens the body of the fly, but it also gives the nymph a good segmented look that the natural has. And then we'll tie the copper off. And I'll take my scissors and I'll trim off the extra bit of copper. Okay, next I'll take my white ostrich hurl and I'll clip a couple of strands. And I'll tie these in right at the midpoint of the hook. The next step then is to select one dark brown hackle feather and one grizzly hackle feather and try to choose a feather that has plenty of webbing. The webbing, if you look at a feather, is the very faint line that runs the length of the feather on either side of the center quill. The part of the feather that absorbs water the best is this webbing material right in here. Just clip my feather so that I don't use any of that down material. The next thing that I that I usually do is I, I'll uh, take the uh, feather and I'll pull all of the fibers away from one side of the feather. Make sure you pull the feathers or the fibers away from the right side of the feather. You want to make sure that when you're wrapping the feather around the hook that the side of the feather with, without any fibers is wrapped against the hook shank. And then I'll just take my scissors and I'll clip just a little bit on the end here so I have some little stubs that'll help the uh, feather to be uh, held onto the hook. And we'll tie the feather in by the butt. And we'll come back and we'll do exactly the same thing with a grizzly feather. tie this grizzly hackle in place and then I'll advance my tying thread right up to the front of the hook. Make sure that you leave enough room in the front to form the head of the fly. Then we can take our black wool and continue wrapping it to the front to form the thorax of the fly. We'll tie that down and clip off the extra. We'll take our hackle pliers then and we'll wrap the two hackle feathers to the front of the hook. About three wraps or so is all you really need. That'll 
will keep everything a little more sparse. Trim off the extra. We'll come back and pick up the second feather. And we'll wrap the dark brown hackle to the front as well. Okay, the, the next step then is to take our ostrich hurl, and this will represent or imitate the gills of a stonefly nymph. We'll trim off the extra amount there. The last step is to form the head of the fly. whip finish we'll trim off the thread and apply a small amount of head cement to the head of the fly and the Brooks Montana nymph is finished stoneflies are found in rivers and streams throughout North America they come in a variety of sizes and colors and some can take up to three years as nymphs to mature. The Brooks Montana stone imitates the large dark colored nymphs of the Terranarsis species found in many western trout streams. Anglers often call these stoneflies salmon flies because of the salmon pink coloration on the abdomen of the adults. I'm using a six weight outfit to help me cast this uh, heavily weighted nymph a little bit easier than a, a lighter line might. And I'm also using a strike indicator about six feet up from the fly. I'm fishing in about three feet of water, so I like to put that indicator up about two times the depth of the water that I'm fishing in. And I like to use the, the indicators that are held in place with a toothpick because I can adjust the indicator to whatever depth of water I'm fishing in. Stonefly nymphs are, are quite poor swimmers, so when they become dislodged and swept downstream in the current, they kind of just drift along at the, the same speed as the current. So you don't want to have any drag in your fly. And that's where a, a strike indicator will really help you to show you what's, uh, what's happening to your fly as well. Because your nymph's drifting along the bottom of the stream, the hook can become dull quite quickly when it runs over rocks and cobbles. So it's very important to check your hook point from time to time and sharpen the point. There's a take. Looks like a rainbow. Let's see if I can get him over here close to shore where I can fight him a little bit easier. rainbow all right Boy, you sure took that stone fly nymph There you go Catch you next time again. The materials you'll need to tie the bird stonefly are dark brown moose body hair, deer hair, furnace hackle, orange floss, and orange thread. To start, I'll attach my tying thread to the hook shank.
For the tail on the bird stonefly, we'll use dark colored moose body hair. Just clip a little bit from the hide. We'll even it up in a hair stacker. The tail, I'll tie it in so that it's about the same length as half the hook shank. I like to tie the tail in somewhere around the middle of the hook or even just slightly above that. Later on it'll give me a good base to wrap the uh, orange floss over. Take my scissors then and trim off the extra. Just tie that down a bit better. And we'll take a piece of orange floss and we'll also tie this in. Then at the very back of the hook we'll take two furnace hackles and we'll tie these in by the butt and we'll also tie these in uh, so that while we're wrapping the feather forwards the dull side of the feather will be wrapped or will be facing forward. So we'll take two furnace hackles. I usually like to take my scissors and trim just a bit on both sides of the stem or of the quill so that you have a few little stubs sticking out. This will help the thread to bite into the hackle so that it won't pull out on you as you're wrapping it. Okay, and then we'll take our thread and we'll move it up so that you have about a third of the hook shank uh, left in front. Then we'll take our floss and we'll wrap the body of the fly. And we'll tie that off. Clip off the extra. And we'll take our hackle pliers. Attach it to one of the hackles. We'll palmer the feather right up to the thread. Tie that one down and clip off the extra. We'll come back and we'll do exactly the same with the second feather, wrapping it right ahead of the first feather. We'll trim the second hackle off, and then we'll take our scissors and we'll give the fly a bit of a haircut. We'll trim these fibers short all the way around the hook. Okay, then we're ready to uh, tie in the wing. For the wing, we'll use uh, some dark gray deer hair. You look at uh, the deer hair once you've clipped it from the hide, often you'll notice a lot of this downy material. And we have to pull or stroke that all out so that the hair will even up for you in the stacker. If you don't, the hair will just stick to itself and it won't even very well. Next, we'll tie this wing in on the very top of the hook and we'll tie it in so that the wing is about the same length as the end of the tail. Tie the wing into place. And then we'll trim off the extra deer hair. And we'll tie that down just a bit better. Then we can take two more furnace hackles and we'll tie these in exactly the same way by the butt. then we'll advance our thread to the front and we'll 
make sure that we leave enough room to form the head of the fly. Then I'll take my hackle pliers, attach it to the feather, and we'll wrap the feather right to the front, stopping right at the thread. We'll tie it off, clip off the extra, and then we'll come back with the second feather, and we'll wrap that to the front as well. Trim off the extra feather. Form the head of the fly. And whip finish. Just a drop of head cement on the head to finish the fly. And we're finished. exciting dry fly opportunities. A large bushy dry fly such as the bird stone fly is a good choice at this time. Okay, let's try this spot right up ahead of us. By allowing your fly to splat or drop fairly hard on the water it'll draw the fish's attention to the fly a lot of times as well could get him to come up as well. There's a take. Oh, nice fish. Looks like a, oh, nice jump. There he is, he's gonna go downstream. He sure wanted that bird stone fly. There he goes, we'll work him below me here. Come on, Mr. Fish. Nice rainbow. Nice rainbow. There he is. What a fish. Wow. Wow. Oh, there you go. We'll put you back in there and come back and try to get you again another day. Woo, what a fish. I think I'm gonna try that some more. The materials that we'll need to tie the gold ribbed hair's ear are a size eight two X long hook, guard hairs from a hair's mask, fine gold wire or tinsel, 
tan fur from a hare's mask, pheasant tail fibers, medium lead wire, and brown tying thread. The gold ribbed hare's ear is one of the most popular and versatile nymph patterns used by fly anglers. It can represent any number of food organisms to trout and is an excellent fly to use in streams and lakes throughout the season. There are several variations of the hare's ear nymph. This is the one I prefer because it's simple and easy to tie. To start, I'll attach my tying thread to the hook shank. I'm tying this fly on a size 8 3x long hook. Often I'll tie this fly on uh, hook sizes from about a size 6 down through a size 16. Okay, next I'll add some lead weight to the hook shank. I'll start at about the middle of the hook and wrap my lead forwards. I'll pinch off the ends and then I'll come back with my tying thread and secure the lead to the hook. For the tail on this fly, I'll use the guard hairs from our hairs mask. I'll tie the tail in at the very back. For the ribbing on this fly, you can use fine gold wire or tinsel. In this case, I'll tie in a short piece of gold tinsel. We'll tie that down. And then I'll just put a drop of head cement on the hook shank just to cover everything up. For the dubbing, I'm also using the tan colored fur from a hair's mask. And we'll dub a small amount onto the thread. And then we'll form the body of the fly. I'll wrap the abdomen to about the midpoint of the hook shank. And then I'll come back and pick up my gold wire. And I'll rib this to the midpoint as well. And then we'll tie it off. and clip off the extra. The next step is to tie in a wing case. I'll uh, use pheasant tail fibers. I could also use the fibers from a turkey quill. We'll tie these in at the midpoint of the hook as well and on the very top of the hook shank. And then we'll add some more dubbing to the thread. And then we'll wrap the thorax make sure you leave enough room in the front to form the head of the fly and then we can take our pheasant tail fibers and we'll fold them over the top of the fly to form the wing case I'll just put a couple of wraps here to hold it in place then take your scissors and I like to trim this off at an angle from the front so that I have a nice smooth taper for the head to be formed over. Form the head of the fly. Whip finish. Put a drop of head cement on the head just to finish the fly. And then I like to take my dubbing needle and poke away at the thorax just to work some of those guard hairs out. And that'll help to imitate the legs of an insect. And our fly is finished.
see if I can sneak up close enough to get a cast over them. I'll see if he'll come up and take my deer hair caddis. Took it, there it is. Nice. There he goes. Oh, he's going right across the river here. Nice fish. He's gonna take me across and downstream here a bit. using a 6x tippet here so I've got to be real careful at how much pressure I put on them. Nice fish. Nice rainbow. Nice rainbow, nice fish, wow, take this hook out and we'll put him back. That was a great fish, let's go back and I'll show you how to tie the deer hair caddis. The materials that you'll need to tie the deer hair caddis are brown hackle, deer hair, brown rabbit fur, and brown tying thread. The hook size that I'll use to tie this deer hair caddis is a size 12. I'll attach my thread to the hook and wrap the thread to the very back of the hook. Next we'll tie in a dark brown dry fly hackle. We'll tie the feather in by the butt section. And I'll tie it on the hook so that when it's wrapped around the body of the fly, the dull part or the dull side of the feather will be facing forward. For the body, I'll use brown rabbit fur. By changing the colors of the materials and tying this fly on the appropriate hook sizes, you can match virtually any caddis fly found in the areas that you fish. Adult caddis flies are very easy to identify. When flying, they appear as moths. When they're at rest, their wings are folded uh, tent-like over their back. Just add a little more dubbing. Okay, I've stopped the body at the one eye width point. I have approximately one eye width space left between the thread and the eye of the hook so that I have enough room to form the head of the fly. Okay, we're ready to wrap the hackle. As soon as we reach the front of the hook, I'll tie the hackle off. Clip off the extra, and we're ready to tie on the wing. I'll use deer hair. We'll put it in our hair stacker so that we can even the tips of the deer hair. When you tie the wing on the deer hair caddis, the very tips of the wing should come just past the bend of the hook. We'll tie the wing in on the, on the fly. Put a 
few wraps just in front. A whip finish. And then we'll take the scissors and we'll trim off the butt ends of the deer hair. This kind of forms the head of the of the fly. And our deer hair caddis is finished. I've tied this deer hair caddis to represent a grasshopper and I'm going to go down below these falls and give it a try. Let's see if there's a cutthroat along this edge here that'll come up and take this deer hair caddis. There he is, missed him. There's a fish. Nice little cutthroat. There he is. Okay. Sure see their orange gash right in their throat area there. The materials that we'll need to tie the woolly bugger are a size 8 3x long hook, black marabou, black chenille, black saddle hackle, black tying thread, and medium lead wire. The woolly bugger is a variation of another wet fly, the woolly worm. The main difference is that the woolly bugger is tied with a marabou tail. When the marabou becomes wet, it waves and undulates in the current, and it has a lifelike appearance that is difficult for trout to resist. Depending on the size and color that you tie the woolly bugger in, it could imitate anything from a leech to a minnow. This fly will catch trout in rivers and lakes any time of the year. To begin, I'll attach my tying thread to the hook shank. And I'll wrap my thread to the very back of the hook. And I usually like to weight all of my woolly buggers, so I'll take some lead wire and I'll wrap the front half of the hook shank with lead. And then I'll come back with my tying thread and just cover over the lead to secure it in place. For the tail on the woolly bugger, I'll use marabou. Just pull away some of the unruly material here. And to even out the marabou, if you just stroke the fibers back until the tips even up, you can either cut the marabou uh, from the plume or you can just pull off the unwanted fibers. Now we'll tie the tail in at the very back of the hook. I usually tie the tail in so that it's about the same length as the hook shank. For the body material, I'll use uh, black chenille. To tie in this chenille, I'll first pull some of the outer fibers away so that just the uh, thread is exposed. And I'll tie this in at the very back of the hook as well. OK, we're ready to tie in our hackle feather. I like to use the feather that comes from a saddle patch. They're very long so that you have enough length to wrap this feather from the back of the hook to the front. Also, if you stroke your fibers back so that they stand out, you'll find that uh, as you're wrapping the hackle to the front, all of the fibers will unravel and it'll look really nice. 
tie this feather in at the very back. I'll tie everything down in place. And just before we wrap the chenille body, I'll put a layer or a coating of head cement on the hook shank. And then we can come back, pick up our chenille, and we'll, ra we'll wrap it to the front as well. tie down the chenille and trim off the extra. Okay, we're ready to wrap our hackle feather now and before I do that I'll take my scissors and I'll just trim off at the butt section so that I uh, don't wrap any of this downy material into the fly. Okay, now I'll take this hackle feather and I'll wrap it form the head of the fly. And whip finish. Drop a head cement to the head of the fly, and our woolly bugger is finished. hook, elastic plastic material, fine gold wire, ginger rabbit fur, fine lead wire, and tan tying thread. The freshwater shrimp or scud is an important food item for trout in many lakes and ponds. Although anglers frequently associate scuds primarily with these still waters, they are also found in flowing waters. Spring creeks in particular often support good populations. The high country scud is my favorite fly pattern to imitate this crustacean. I'll start by attaching my tying thread to the hook shank. I'm tying this scud pattern on a size 10 hook. 
although I'll tie these flies right down to about a size 16. Okay, next I'll attach three or four wraps of lead to the hook shank. And then I'll come back with my tying thread and I'll make a few wraps over the lead just to secure it to the hook. For the tail, I'll use a few fibers from a hen hackle feather. I'm going to be tying this fly in a ginger color, so I'm using hackle fibers that will match the color of the body. I like to tie a very short tail. For the shell uh, back material on this scud pattern, you can use uh, a plastic sandwich bag that you've cut into strips, or I like to use a clear plastic uh, material that you can pick up at any fabric store. It's a very stretchy material. Before I tie this onto the hook, I'll take my scissors and I'll trim one end of this plastic material to a V-shape. And then I'll tie this on at the back of the hook. For the ribbing, I'll tie in a short piece of fine gold wire. And I'll take my dubbing needle and I'll apply a thin layer of head cement to the hook shank. And while that glue is drying, I'll dub a small amount of ginger dyed rabbit fur to the thread. Because scuds come in a wide variety of colors, you'll probably want to tie these up uh, to match the naturals in the areas you fish. Often I'll tie these in oh, olive or tan colors as well. I'll also tie some of my scud imitations unweighted as well. And then we can begin to wrap the body. I'll come forward with this uh, dubbing material and I'll stop at about the one eye width point so I have enough room to form the head of the fly. The next step then is to take our plastic material and we'll pull it, fold it over the very top or the back of the fly. And then we'll tie it down with the tying thread. To trim this plastic material off, if you uh, grab a hold of it and just pull up on it slightly to stretch it, and then cut it. You can get a nice clean cut there. Okay, then we can come back and pick up our gold wire and we'll rib the wire forward over the body. This will give the fly a good segmented look that the natural has and it will also help to strengthen the body of the fly. We'll tie that down, trim off the wire, and then we can form the head of the fly. Whip finish. Put a small drop of head head cement on the head of the fly and what I usually do now is I'll take my dubbing needle and I'll poke away at the underbody just to work some of the long guard hairs out and this will help to imitate the gills and the legs of a natural. There's <laughs>
catch a few trout using our high country scud imitation. Oh, bad cast. Bad cast. Bad cast. This water is so clear up here you can actually see them chase. There he is. He took it. Nice colors on this one. The water's so clear up here you can actually see them follow your fly and take it. Especially with these polarized sunglasses. There he is. This is to show you how to land a fish without a landing net. If you grab them and hold them upside down, they usually don't struggle too much. And there he is. Nice little cutthroat. There he goes. Scuds swim in a very erratic manner. And to imitate this, I retrieve my fly in really short little pulls. And you can let it stop and sink, and then keep retrieving it again. There's a the fish, just a little guy. We caught some pretty nice cutthroat in this lake. Now.